Hi, in this clip, we are going to talk about Rumi's sexuality. There are some debates around the web and some communities that Rumi might have had some homosexual interest towards his spiritual master, who was well known as Shams Tabrizi. It's coming up. Before we get deep into this topic, it's necessary for us to learn some of the principles and traditions going around Islam, Sufism, and Dervishhood. There's this methodology in Islam and Sufism that if a person wants to learn all the essentials of spirituality and religion, they have to look up to someone who has already mastered all the religious and spiritual concepts. And some branches of Islam, like Sufism, they insist that if a person wants to learn the spiritual concepts, they have to choose a master who is alive so they can lively learn the actual spirit of the religion, which is spirituality. So I want you guys to understand that there is some sort of hierarchy or ranking in teaching and learning spiritual concepts in Islam or even in any religion, I think in a way that you go to a spiritual master or religious cleric to learn all the secrets and techniques of spirituality. And then after a while, you become a spiritual master yourself and you'll be ready to teach others. Now let's get to the interesting part, which is Rumi and Shams' relationship. We have to know before meeting Shams, Rumi was just a very strict cleric who was very obsessed with the laws and rituals of the religion rather than its heart and spirit. So what Shams did to Rumi was to shift his focus from the periphery of Islam to the core and kernel of Islam, which is the spirituality. So think of any religion as some kind of fruit or not, which its cover is something that you have to work through to get to its core and kernel, which is the edible, enjoyable, and beneficial part which is spirituality. Therefore, think about it. What kind of enormous impression Shams had on Rumi? The Rumi we enjoy reading his poems today is actually the work of Shams. Shams changed the view of Rumi to the actual real meaning and purpose of life and universe. So Rumi definitely loved Shams as his spiritual father. Having a spiritual father is still so common among Muslims and dervishes even today. And the same way you love your own father, you may love your spiritual father. And loving your father doesn't necessarily reflect any sexual activity, my friends. And even if Rumi's orientation had shifted to something we consider as homosexual today, that would not diminish his legacy or his profound contributions. It's entirely possible to be a great saint or sage and also be homosexual. Such a truth would only add another perfectly fine dimension to his humanity and his journey. One other important matter to realize here is that after this life-changing event, which was meeting Shams, Rumi started to versify his mystical knowledge that he obtained from Shams into some poems that may seem very amatory in surface. But these poems are actually following some conventions in Persian spiritual literature that might have dated back to thousand years ago. These conventions just help Persian mystic poets like Hafez and Rumi to elaborate on sweetness of absorbing divine love into their soul or nourishing the divine love already inside their soul depending on what way you look at it. I'm gonna give you an example. One of these conventions is getting fantasized with the curl of the beloved's hair. But the curl of the beloved's hair is actually the representation of the twists and complexity of the spiritual journey. And the same way that touching and going through the curls of the beloved's hair will eventually help us reaching the beloved's head or brain, going through the twists and turns of the spiritual journey will eventually help us reaching the head, core or brain of divine love and establishing the actual connection to God. Therefore, my friends, we can't think that every time Rumi is talking about the beloved's hair or lips or something like that, he's actually talking about physical human face features or even talking about Sham's lips or hair. One other reason that the supporters of Rumi's homosexuality say that it's Oh, Rumi and Shams used to leave town so many times together and they leave town for a long time 
in the way that even Rumi's wife got too upset with them. But there's another concept in mysticism or Sufism that these people really don't understand, and that is seclusion. So what Sufis used to do in order to purify their soul and get closer to God was to find a segregated location away from the crowd and noisiness of big towns, and they would just meditate there. Same thing that monks kind of do even today. And what Rumi and Shams would do was to go to Osamati's hermitage to meditate and contemplate, to discover the secrets of the universe and true meaning of life. And they would discuss their findings with each other. There is one saying that stated that Rumi and Shams once had a discussion on truth for straight 40 days. And in the end, considering what I just said, I gotta just say, it's kind of normal for Rumi's wife or even his son to get jealous of Shams. Because before appearance of Shams in Rumi's life, they had more of Rumi's times for themselves. All that said, it doesn't mean that homosexuality or even pedophilia didn't exist among Sufis or Muslims even today. To this date, unfortunately, there have been some reports of pedophilia and homosexuality even among the religious clerics and their students, even during, before, or after their Quran teaching sessions. Even Rumi has a verse in which he explicitly criticizes these types of sexualities and some traditions that used to be common in some sophistic monasteries at his era. In the end, I leave the conclusion to you guys. And please, like it, share it, and subscribe it to spread the divine love among us. And let me know of any remarks you may have. This will also help you guys to get more of the same videos the next time you log in to YouTube. Farewell. Thank <laughs> you.